Good morning, church. And good morning to everyone that's joining us online this morning. Why don't you make your way to your seats and stand with us. We're going to worship our amazing God this morning. Thank you, Jesus. You're so worthy of our praise.
Chama repetio ko tasha yembo ke oma sekiao wa siki tata muya yesu boka ramata ramata kichapata tumia. This morning in my prayer time, I was praying and. Uh, word sovereign God came into place in my mind and then I came into church and Sally before she started worship practice led the team in prayer and talked about God as being a sovereign father today God would have you know that he is a sovereign God he is the creator of all things he is the God that is in charge of all things the ruler of all things but at the same token he is a loving father caring father so much so that he would send his own son to die on the cross so that he might make a way available for us again to enter boldly into his presence. And so this day, I would have you know, and I'd have you secure in the knowledge that God is in charge and that you can faithfully put your trust in him, knowing that he loves you and cares for you, that he is a sovereign God.
we do that this morning. We stand in awe of you. We tell you we love you. We tell you we appreciate you. And Lord God, to the best of our ability, we put our trust in you. Father, we just lift up Beryl Odd right now. We just thank you for being home, Father. We thank you for your looking after her and we just pray you continue to touch her body. We think of the others, Lord God, that were on the prayer request this morning that came out and we do just lift up each person on that list. Father, that you might continue to touch their bodies intervene in their circumstances, Lord God. Father, that your name might be glorified. We give you thanks in Jesus' lovely name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Why don't you please take your seats and uh, we're going to join right now with communion and uh, going to invite Dawn Owen if she'd like to come and lead us in communion this morning. Morning, everybody. Would the work welcome team please hand out the elements? Thank you. Hi, so for anybody who doesn't know me, my name's Dawn Owen, and with my husband Peter and our friend Elaine, I help to organise the Embrace group. When I asked God what he wanted me to bring this morning, a worship song came into my mind. Not I, but through Christ in me. And at first I thought, oh, this is just me clinging at straws. But then I realised that's what communion is for me, a reminder that I owe everything to Christ. The first verse of the song says it all. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. There's so much to be grateful for, just as the verse says. There's nothing more for heaven now to give. Think about that for a moment. Jesus did it all. Everything we need was accomplished in his death and resurrection. The benefits of his sacrifice go beyond salvation. We can experience benefits here on earth because Christ lives in us through the Holy Spirit. So what are some of these benefits? I don't have time to talk about them all, so I'll just mention four. First of all, there's grace. When I think about God's grace, I think about two things. Firstly, the acronym that everybody knows, God's riches at Christ's expense. We've got everything we need to be a child of God, but it's only through Christ's death that this is possible. 2 Timothy 1.9 says it like this. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. And the second thing I think about when I hear grace is God's empowering presence. God has given us his power to overcome our weaknesses. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 8 to 9. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. So whatever our weaknesses are, the Holy Spirit is in us to help us to overcome them. Then we can also meditate on righteousness. God's righteousness imputed to us by what Christ did on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 makes it clear. God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Our relationship with God can only be because of Christ's sacrifice in our place. Only he lived a sinless life. Only he was good enough to be that perfect sacrifice. Communion should be a constant reminder of this. And 
then there's freedom. What does freedom mean to you? How do you see the freedom we have in Jesus? Galatians 5, 13 to 14 tells us, if you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature, instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbour as yourself. That is a real challenge. Freedom isn't about us, it's about others. Jesus was free to refuse to die for us, but he gave up his freedom to do his Father's will. Do we use our freedom as an opportunity to do God's will? Another aspect to meditate on as we take the elements. So we've got grace, we've got righteousness and freedom, and there's peace, God's peace. It doesn't depend on external circumstances, it's in us. Jesus talks about how we can have this peace in Matthew 11, 28 to 29. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That's a promise. Rest for our souls. That's real peace. So as we take the elements this morning, let's meditate on some of the things we have just because Christ chose to die for us. Grace, righteousness, freedom, and peace. Remember why we have these. It's not because we've learned how to be these things. It's through Christ living in us. Please take the elements in your own time. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you were prepared to die in our place. Thank you that we can now have your grace, righteousness, freedom and peace. Not because of what we do, because of what you did. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Would you please pass the glasses to the end of the row? Thank you. Thanks, Dawn. Let's thank Dawn for a great communion. I don't know what you do, but uh, when I listen to people speak, uh, whether it be a message or a communion like we've just had or anything else, I always try and get one, one thing out of it that I can take home and meditate on it. And the thing I got from that was freedom isn't about us, it's about others. What a great line. Thank you very much, Dawn. Really appreciate it. Well, we're going to take time out quickly for 60 seconds to go and see somebody you don't know, shake somebody's hand, and this is an opportunity for the kids to come and get some chubba chubs. Kids, help yourselves.
Okay, why don't you take your seats? That'll be fantastic. Hey, Roman, Roman. Judah. Don't know, Dad's got it. Well, welcome to church and a special welcome this morning to uh, Michael and Georgia Gahardi. The new, the new Mr. and Mrs. Gahardi. Why don't you stand? First time back in church as a married couple. And I have a present for you. A pink and a blue, because I'm so PC. God bless you. It's fantastic to have you in church this morning. And it's a really tremendous joy to have all the kids in church. I just love family time in church and when we see all the kids in church and just uh, have them here for us on a Sunday, this is just a brilliant thing. And you notice that we have worked out how to keep the kids quiet during church. We give them a gobstopper. Now they're not allowed to eat it, they've got to suck it. And I guarantee you if they suck it, it'll last right to the last second the church finishes, okay? And uh, if they finish it, then put the stick down their throat or something like that, okay? <laughs> No, don't, 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 don't. That sounded like a Peter Harris, didn't it? There's colouring sheets at the back, uh, cry room out the back for one year old and parent. Uh, sorry, cry room at the back for one year old plus only one parent, please. And in the back we have the crash running as normal for one to three year olds. There's connect cards uh, available for you at the end of the stairwell. Also, there's a QR code inside your notice sheet. We'd love you to fill that in if you're new here. We'd love to be able to connect with you, answer any questions you have, uh, help you in any special way. And tonight we have the joy of Steph Berry ministering the message. It will be online, uh, it'll be in person only, so make certain you get out for that. Thank you for your tithes and offerings. We do appreciate the way that you give. We thank you for honouring God's word and honouring God in the first fruits of what you get. We encourage you to either do it online in an envelope or you can put cash in an envelope and put it into the information um, letterboxes over there. And also uh, we continue to give to Amari as our mission. Amari is our mission support and uh, the best way to do that is either online on the Amari, Amari website or on the tap and go machine that's sitting over there. You'll notice that we have some new tins we ran out of tins and uh, it's been a big time getting them, I can tell you. Thank you very much to Craig Moulton and the family for doing that for us. Great way of being able to use uh, your loose change, your coin, and also uh, just uh, help Amari. It's an amazing amount of money comes in through these tins. So there's a whole lot over there. Please help yourself. Also, I have a registered Amari for the uh, container deposit scheme now, and so you can... Uh, drop off all your cans and all your bottles, etc., etc., etc. There's a QR code that you can get. I'll get it into the notice sheet next week. Or get the cash, grab a tin, and start putting some money in there. I did my first bag of bottles and stuff the other day. It was $10.90, and it went straight into the tin. So I encourage you to do that. Um, be the love. At the moment, we have the Term 2 meal roster to support families in our church community with meals. Uh, if you're available and can help with that, we'd love you to do that through the Church Centre app. Also, Siri has expressed a need for canned goods coming in in the cooler months. Baked beans, spaghetti, soup, tuna, anything would be appreciated and we've put up a collection table down the, back, uh, down the foyer for that. Friday nights are back. No, well, they haven't gone away, but Friday nights are starting up again for us as a church. Kids Roar, Roar Energy, Uproar and Frontline Youth are all back this Friday, and here endeth the announcements. Let's welcome Pastor Andy and Pastor Peter as they come to share. <laughs> not, pa oh, stay there, you're, you're not allowed. Pastor Pete's not allowed up yet. It's just me, thanks Pastor Graham. Very good. Good morning church. How are we doing today? Excellent, and a big good morning to everyone who is watching online. We're so thankful that you have joined us for church as well. It is a great day to be in church as well. I'm looking for, uh, not here, not here, not here, not here. It's okay. Another day, another day. Um, in a few moments, I'm going to ask Pastor Pete to come up 
to, um, to the stage. But before we do that, uh, it, it really is a privilege to have him here with us today. Uh, I wanted you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 84 for me. Grab your Bibles. Grab your Bibles out. Kids, if you've got your Bibles here, Psalm 84 today. When I was quite young, uh, I went up with my parents on a road trip up to New South Wales. And as part of this road trip, we visited a family there or a couple there that I didn't know them personally. My parents did, but they had told me a little bit about this couple. And so this was my first time to meet them. And going to their house... It was one of those houses where my parents said to me as a young child, it was one of those don't touch anything houses. Do you know what I'm talking about? Did you get that when you were young? Whenever we get, just don't touch anything. And so I went in understanding this. Now, I don't remember much about the outside of the house, but I remember some things about the interior of this house. Two things. I don't know why these are the two things, but they stuck in my mind. The first thing was that they had a pool table, and this was the biggest pool table I've ever seen in my life. It was like a tournament-sized pool table. I thought a pool table was a pool table, and all of them were the same size. No, I learned something, because I could hardly see over the top of this thing. It was so big and so long. The second thing I remember was that the walls were soft in this house. Now, I don't know if this is the era or this was that level of house, but it was like there were felt walls. Has anybody experienced that any, anything? You have? You have? Some people. Otherwise, I was just wondering whether it was my own interpretation of what I was touching or what I was feeling at that period of time. But it was these things that I could remember. And it was the more that you explored this house, the more wonderful things that you uncovered And it was, again, you might relate to this, it was the kind of house where you you got there and you're like, the more I find, the more I just don't want to leave. The more I just want to stay here and explore and experience because it was a really nice place to be. Well, the writers of Psalm 84, the sons of Korah, are explaining, in a way, a home like this where you just don't want to leave. But the difference is that what's good about this home that we're going to read about here is not the velvet walls, It's not the pool table, Uh, it's not the excellent games room, but it's who's present in this home. And of course, we're talking about the presence of Almighty God. So let's read Psalm 84. We're going to read from verse 1, and we're going to stop at verse 4. It says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies. Whose dwelling place? The Lord's. How wonderful, how lovely is your dwelling place. I long, yes, I faint with longing, to enter the courts of the Lord. And I wonder, as I was reading that, I wonder if that is the way that we approach God, the way that we look at our quiet times with Him. I I faint with longing. I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord, to be in His presence. With my whole being, body and soul, I will shout joyfully to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home. And the swallow builds her nest and raises her young. Even the most, the smallest or perhaps even the most insignificant find their home and a place near your altar. O Lord of heaven's armies, my King and my God, what joy for those who can live in your house, always singing your praises. I don't know if you can hear the revelation that the writers are getting here of what it is to be in the presence of God, to dwell with him. It's not a joy because of how comfortable the house is nor how quick the Wi-Fi is, nor how well stocked the pantry is. There is none of that that we see, but it's a joy because God is there and they can always sing his praises. They continue to go on. We're going to read from verse 10 with these words to exalt him. A single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. Other versions would say a doorkeeper, a door holder, a gatekeeper or a door holder, which means that like even, even on the outermost skirts of this compound, even right at the edge of the house, even just on the door, just so I'm just on the edge, it is better, it's better for me to do that than to live the good life in the homes of the wicked. For the Lord God, he is our son and he is our shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. O Lord of heaven's armies, 
What a joy for those who trust in you. What a gift to us it is that we as followers of Christ are welcomed into the presence of God. And access to this presence, to his presence, is available for all of us. Look at what Ephesians 3.12 says. It says, because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. And at any point throughout the day, by the grace of Jesus Christ, you and I have access to God, to his presence you know, it's one thing we teach our kids from a very young age is that when it comes to prayer, that you can pray to God whenever you want. You can always pray to God and he will hear your prayers. He is with us. And yet it's the simplicity of that truth that sometimes means that it doesn't hold the weight that it ought to hold. Because the fact is that you can always pray to God. You can always speak to him. He is present. And he is present with us and welcomes us into his presence. And that is an incredible truth for us to know. And so my prayer for us today, as we have the joy of hearing from, from Pastor Pete, that you would be inspired towards an increased closeness of your relationship with God. Because God knows that the best thing for you and the best thing for me is to be close to him, for us to worship the one. So I am very much looking forward to this conversation and can we please welcome Pastor Pete Harris up to the stage today. Thanks, Nick. Can get rid of that? Thanks, gents. All right, Pete. Bring it over. I'll, ta- I'll bring it for you. Yeah, no, no, we're not going to. No, we're all right. Here you go. I'll give you this mic. Welcome, sir. Thank you. It's scary. It's Stop. scary. There's a few more here than in kids' ministry. Yeah. Um, Parents are scary. But it's okay. <laughs> Parents are not scary. We are not. We are not. Come on, give Pete some love, everyone. <laughs> That's love. That's love. Looks so. so for those who might be visiting with us or who are watching online or who are new, this is Pastor Pete Harris. Pastor Pete is our children's pastor here at LMC. And Pete has been on staff with us since January of 1989. Long time. That is a long time. Pete, I was, what, five years old. I've got photos. <laughs> <laughs> I've got stuff on him. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Um, Pete, Pete has been on staff in many different roles. It hasn't just been children's pastor, but he's been on maintenance team. He's been a cleaner here and also uh, our, um, our children's pastor and is uh, husband to Jenny, sitting right there, and father to Matt, who is in China, uh, yep. China right now, yep. and Laura, who's over there, and Rachel as well. So, Pete, it is a, it is a joy. Thank you very much for uh, being willing to share with us today and face the, the fear of all the parents. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Pete, I know that you have such a passion for our kids, and anybody who has met Pete, or has seen him working with the kids both here in church and in the community, would understand the passion that he has for our children. But Pete, I understand that that hasn't always been the case, and God has really like stirred that passion in you for children. So tell us a little bit about kind of where that began. Okay, I became a Christian in uh, 1987, and um, yeah, just really, really love God. You know, just God, God changed my life. He really, really did. And I uh, went to Bible college and, in, you know, enjoyed Bible college, enjoyed learning about God um, and got to do CRE, which was uh, first introduction to kids. Not really interested in kids, just loved uh, sharing the gospel, loved re- researching the word and just talking about God. And uh, I really didn't have a, a desire for kids. In fact, um, those who really know me know that I didn't really want to have kids either. I want nothing to do with kids. Uh, kids scared the daylights out of me. Um, a lot of that was because I was such a foul-tempered person as a child myself um, that I scared me to be around kids because if I lost my temper, I could do stupid things. And there was a lot, lot of other stuff involved. But I, I loved God. And I know when, whatever God asked me to do, I said, and whatever you want me to do, I will do. And that was the thing that he got me doing. Most of the things I did throughout my life, um, areas of ministry or work or whatever, I didn't want to do at the start. 
And it all came back to God would say, but I want you to do it. And I'd do it. And so with children, he asked me uh, to start doing CRE. This is after Bible college. I was in the shower one night. Amazing, I had a shower. And um, God just said, I want you to do CRE. And we had this talk back and forwards about it. And um, finally, I submitted because you can't hide from God. And started doing CRE, but still did not have a heart for kids. I just love teaching. Love talking about God to anyone who would listen. So um, I was out one day just at the, uh, I, remember this, I remember this moment, I was at the Oval, leaning on a rail, and I was just looking at this family playing together, and I started crying. God's timing sucks, because you're out in the middle of everyone and you start crying. But from that point on, God started a work, and the reason why I didn't want to, uh, had the problem with kids, went all the way back to my own childhood, not just the anger, but it went deep, more deep-rooted than that. And from that point on, God just started doing a work. There's nothing specific I can say along the time, but just the more time you spend with God, the more he can change you. And no matter what he calls you to do, in this case it's kids, um, it's not about having a passion for kids, it's having a passion for God. And when you spend time with God, whatever he asks you to do, whatever he puts in front of you, whatever you're going through, he gives you that desire to do it and he'll give you the strength, he'll give you all the tools that you need. And that's what I've discovered along my journey. That's amazing. That is such great truth. That is for someone to take home today. So, Pete, so you had no, no plan as a young man or even as an early Christian to have a goal to be children's pastor, right? No, nah, no, not at all. When I was in, it's funny, when we were in college, we had to pray about what God wanted us to do when we left college. And every time I started to pray, um, I started laughing. And I couldn't stop laughing, you know. And I, Ken Symes called us up, what are you, you going to do when you leave Bible college? And I said, I don't know, God, I just keep laughing. And, um, but I remember people saying, look, I, I want to be, I'm going to be a, a youth pastor, I'm going to be a lead pastor. And I just said to God, I'll just pick up the crumbs. And it's not, not because I was hum, being humble or anything like that, it's just because I had no idea what God wanted me. I'll just, whatever you ask me to do, I'll do. And that's basically where it started. It's beautiful, mate. It really is. And I know that's something that has continued to, um, almost keep you steady right throughout your whole period of ministry life and uh, you know I, I think that we can all as a and, and even as a young person for all young people here if you don't have a clear uh, clear idea of exactly what it is that God wants you to do start there start there that it's not about what he has you doing but it's about loving God first and let him stir a passion out of that that's it, and he'll take you to places which you wouldn't even think of. He says you can do mm. far more than you can think or imagine, and it is yep. so true. Amen. So tell me about the uh, coming onto staff here, and how did, like, for a guy that really doesn't want to be involved in kids, how did that happen? Uh, um, basically, I started you know, working at, as a cleaner, then I started doing the maintenance, and uh, God's continued to build. I was doing CRE. That was a great thing about uh, doing the, the cleaning. And God knows what he's doing. It gave me the opportunity to do CRE and an and opening came, so I started doing that. And I think the desire, as I said, the desire to God, as he shared his heart for the kids uh, in me, I think that desire just started to grow. And um, it just kept growing and yeah, it didn't sort of wake up one morning and say, I just love kids. It was just, I love God and that. He'd transfer that heart into me. So. And then obviously um, Pastor Graham saw something in you to then ask you to come on board. Yeah, Gr Pastor Graham asked me. He, uh, <laughs> he asked me to come on board and uh, so I did two days a week and I said the only condition is that you don't call me pastor. I didn't feel worthy enough to be called pastor. I just want to be a children's worker. And so I started two days a week and had the joy of having Ken and Dorothy uh, running the Children Bible Crusade across the road, and they were, they were brilliant. I spent most of my lunchtimes there just gleaning from their wisdom. And, uh, in fact, when Alex come looking for me, if he couldn't find me, he'd, he'd come over there because I'd sneak off and yeah, it should be working. But yeah. So 20, 25 years around about yeah. in this role as children's pastor, as leader of the children's ministry, whatever you want to term it, 
And I know that one of the richest parts of this is not just the kids that you've ministered to, but it's the leaders of the kids that you have ministered to as well, of which there are so many uh, young adults now, or even even in fully fledged adults, young adults, adults that are, have benefited from your teaching of them as well. And so you are looking forward to this year. Twenty twenty four has come. It's another year to get get your teeth into it and and get involved um, and see what God has doing, what God has done, what he, he is doing, what He's going to do through kids ministry. But then towards the start of the year, literally things stopped. <laughs> things stopped. They stopped all of a sudden. Yes. And so, uh, so tell us, what happened? Yeah, I started at the beginning of the year and had everything sort of planned out. Knew what we are going to do for uh, Friday nights, for Sunday, for CADS. Um, yeah, had worked it all out. And uh, I remember on that morning, uh, the 17th of January, had a meeting with Dave Williamson at 7 o'clock. That's the last thing I sort of remember of that day at all. Um, came in and then the next time I woke up was a couple of days later... In, in hospital, um, so I'm trying to. I've been putting together pieces of what other people have been telling me what happened, but apparently I was talking to Norellis is about uh, twelve twenty, and uh, is that right, Norell? Twelve twenty. Good, thanks. This night, if I get it right, and just did I forget it wrong, and yeah, and uh, we're just talking away, and all of a sudden I stopped talking, and made some weird noise, which I usually make weird noises anyway. Um, and Narelle said to Sky, what's, what's Pete doing? She said, he's asleep. And praise God, when you think of it, you know, Narelle just said, no, he's not, and jumped out of her chair. And you think, wow, because you said, do sleep. Um, but she jumped out of the chair and um, saw that I'd, I'd stopped breathing, or well, my heart had stopped as well. Uh, the maintenance guys, it's, it's really interesting the way it, it really did all happen because... Um, People often ask you in hospital, how did this happen? So I'm sort of jumping around a bit. But people often ask you, yeah, do we recount what happened? And they say, gee, you were lucky. But luck was nothing to do with it. Maintenance guys were up here working, um, instead of being you know, outside during the holidays, they were up here. Uh, they came down, helped me off the chair, and Narelle started CPR, which I was asleep for, which is good. Um, <laughs> would have been a free, would have, I was just thinking it would have been funny to wake up, hey, Ralph, what are you doing? You know, that would have been really great. <laughs> But God let me sleep through it. Um, and he ran down and got the defib. He knew we, we only had one defib at that stage and he ran down and got that. Um, Hamish came down from the maintenance shed. He cut my shirt off and hasn't given it back yet. Uh, <laughs> kind of person does that. And, um, and then within in about 10 minutes, I think, uh, three ambulances rolled up, which is just amazing to have three roll up so quick. And... Um, they uh, put me into a bit of a coma because I started fighting with them. They were putting the mask on me to give me oxygen. You don't do that. Um, and so I'm fighting them, so they put me in a coma just to take me to hospital. And uh, as the doctor said when we were talking about it afterwards, he said, if you had been outside, you wouldn't be walking around today. So it was God had everyone in the right place at the right time. Um, and people often say, oh, gee, you're lucky. And I said, no. And I had the joy, it was a real joy to be able to tell everyone who spoke to me, and they, they can't get away from me in hospital, they're sitting there, they come to check your pulse or whatever, so I give them the testimony <laughs> of what God, is, what God did. And yeah, his timing was beautiful, as we, always. Uh, absolutely, and uh, it's as you look back, you see the way that God had his hand on different moments throughout that day, the fact that even for me, being there, uh, not working Wednesdays yeah. normally, and I happen to be in the office and, and to hear that call from Narell. Not allowed to work Wednesdays anymore. I know. But, I, uh, this week I actually had to swap my days and I was in on Wednesday and I said to the staff, please just be careful, all right? Just <laughs> set yourselves up for a good day on Wednesday. Um, and, and to that point and to, you know, even talk to people and say the fact that there was CPR that was done rapidly, there was a defib available rapidly, uh, those two things, but then we all, we all say what you said as well, the fact that God was involved in this, God was involved, and for our other staff, and you're, sometimes you're in a position, fortunately, our staff had done uh, first aid yeah. in the December, just prior, so only a month, we we're only a month out of that, and to have all of those things in place, but sometimes you get in those, those times where you're just like, oh, this is out of my control, and I do not know what to do. And you, you just have to continue to say, God, 
guide me. God, guide me. God, you are here. And for our staff that were there while the ambos are working, we just, we just pray. What else is there that you can do? We continue to pray. And the, uh, the peace of God that was there while all of that was happening was so evident for the ambos and for everyone involved. It was, uh, it was incredible to understand his provision. So it was a few days, obviously. Or do you want to add anything to that? No, it's just the, the, the prayer thing. You know? Yeah. Everyone was just praying. You know? Yeah. You know, you underestimate the power. I, did, I used to underestimate the power of prayer at times because that experience it uh, a lot. And I'll go into this when we talk about hospital. But just they have people standing around praying, calling on the big guns. You know, getting God in there. That's it. Um, That's it. It's just amazing. The only thing I'm annoyed about is I slept through the whole ambulance ride. You, know, you get the ambulance, you got the sirens going, and it, I slept through it. Yeah, a few good days of rest, and then. Then. After a few days, uh, we've got this first photo that we can show. So after a few days, this was you. This was actually the first time that any of us had seen Pete with his eyes open. And so after they had um, woken him up from the coma, we'd seen him with his eyes open. But Pete, you have no recollection of this, do you? No, no. I'm glad I don't either. I mean, you can't understand why Jenny loves that, do you? can you? <laughs> but, um, no, I don't. They woke me up uh, apparently twice. They woke me up and I struggled and fought with them. Uh, but I don't remember anything about having the oxygen. Yeah. I remember hearing what I told people later on was Darth Vader because he hit it. And it was the air thing. That's all I remember hearing it, but I don't remember anything. I don't remember anything of that day. Mm. And so this next photo then is when you can start to have a little bit of memory. And this one now... This one can now tell us about that watermelon because it's in an unfortunate position in the photo, <laughs> but it has a purpose. That watermelon, doesn't it? Yeah, I was probably unconscious, and Graham took the photo, <laughs> so he put the watermelon there. Um, no, the watermelon because every time you sneeze or cough, your, your chest hurts because of, of the CPR, and so I just have to squeeze that. Don't know why they gave me a watermelon. It could have been a danger of me eating it in the days <laughs> while I was. But, uh, yeah, I remember, I remember that. I remember that photo, but I don't remember the, yeah. Yeah. much about it. Um, I remember waking up and the nurse asking me, um, do you want to ring anyone? And I said, oh, I, I ring Graham Nelson. So she tried to ring Graham Nelson and he didn't answer the phone. So I said, I'll ring Jenny. And... Uh, she didn't answer the phone either. So I'm looking at the nurse. She goes, what do you want to do now? And I go, I'm feeling unloved. So, <laughs> but they'd already been there for two days. You know, you're, you know. you're saying you feel unloved, but the first person you called was Graham and not your wife. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would have had to explain to Jenny what had happened. I would have just ran Graham in hospital. I had heart attack. He goes, oh, yeah, not a problem. I'll fix it up. That would have been easy. I wouldn't have had to... We don't talk much, guys. We just know. <laughs> we just know. Uh, so thanks, thanks for that. So that again, that photo, the, the smile was there for Pete, and we could see life come back into Pete, and it was a, just a gradual process, but a joy. Um, Pete, tell us about some of the way that well, you've talked about God's provision through those moments downstairs in the office, but God's provision and the way that you saw Him at work through those couple of weeks that you're actually in the hospital for. Yeah, it's a, I suppose a, a lot of things. Um, once you started to get a bit more conscious. So I think about work and everything like that and uh, my first thought was about kids' ministry. Um, but I just love, because I don't remember Wednesday, we were supposed to have a meeting and do a planning meeting and that Narelle told me, well, we did that. So I don't remember any of it. So whether they did what I asked or not, i got no idea, but the term flowed. Um, I'd already organised with Jerry Morris. He rang me. I, I don't remember talking to him, but he told me you know, I talked to him and arranged to pick up the bus at 12.20. Praise God for that. Um, just the way everything sort of came together, um, just, yeah, God's provision, God's timing. I just think if I had been driving, if it had been half an hour later, I would have been driving the bus back. Um, that would have been good, it wouldn't have been good. A couple of days beforehand, I was driving a bus full of kids, you know. And, um, so, yeah, God's, God's timing, his provision. Um, but just even in, in the hospital, God's, just the peace of God. It was it's weird looking back. It was like a holiday. You know, I was in hospital and I, everything that's going on, I didn't worry about anything. I didn't, didn't click about the heart attack. I know I'd had a, a seizure. My, people kept telling me that all the time, that my heart had stopped. But it didn't sort of mean it. I was just enjoying it. it was, it's weird to say. It was just 
It was just fun. I got to talk to nurses and doctors about what God had done. Uh, I got to walk around. I gave a few, offer them a race. You know, I'd be walking and, uh, very awkwardly. And you catch up to a nurse and you go, do you want to race? And they go, oh, no, I'm going the other way. I said, chicken. And I'd keep going. <laughs> and we'd, we'd have a lot of fun. And just, you know, God's, uh, just, yeah, God's peace, his provision, and just the provision of prayer. That's one thing. I have people say, I'm praying for, and I said, I can tell. And it's the first time I, and we, we say, you know, we pray for people and say, oh, I thank you very much. But I could sense the prayer because I couldn't concentrate. My attention span, I do a devotion in the morning, a, a little devotion book, and it'd take me half an hour to read a page. I'd start reading, I'd fall asleep, and then I'd wake up, and where I'd oh, start again. And uh, so I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't even pray properly. And, but just to notice the, the peace that I had. Like I said, it was like a holiday camp. It was just fun. Tell us about um, your experience in the MRI machine because that's not something that you were looking forward to, really, and really there's a miracle in, in that itself. Yeah, I'm scared of tight spaces and um, it comes back to something that happened when I was a, a child and I won't go into it too much because we're on screen that. But um, even as a kid, if you try to put your hand over my face, I'll punch, bite, scratch, do whatever to get, get you away from me. I'm really scared of tight spaces. And uh, MRI, I remember my, my mum went through it when she had cancer and she'd tell me, and I'd, have night, I'd wake up in the middle of the night with nightmares just thinking about MRI. And I was told that I had to do an MRI because I don't know why my heart stopped. So they want to find out why it stopped so hopefully uh, it won't happen again. And uh, Graeme, and I love this man because I've known him since I was a new Christian. He's been straight down the line with me every step of the way. Sorry, Graeme, I get teary now. <clears throat> and I said, I've got to do an MRI. And he goes, well, Pete, you've got to do it. You've got to, you've got, you've got to go through it. You've got to buckle up and do it. And I said, yeah, you're right. And that made me train my, my thought. I gotta, so the only person I can talk to about that is God because he's the only one who's going to get me through it. But also people praying, and, and that's what people were saying. We were praying for that MRI because they knew how scary it was. And I had total peace about it. And so I went down, the day came from the MRI, I went in there and um, talking to the people there, just total peace about it, which was really, really strange. Every time I thought about it, I'd go, oh, I'm going to MRI, and then I'd go, oh, I'm all right. And until they told me, oh, no, that's right, they said I can have an injection and put me to sleep. I go, you beaut, that's even better. And when I got down to the bottom where they're going to, they're doing the final prep, I said, oh, you forgot the injection. Uh, we can't give you one, you've got to be awake. Oh, so I go, okay, okay, God, you're in charge. So the peace came back again. Then, I, then the guy in front of me, he's only in there for 10 minutes. I said, beauty, I've only got a heart thing. It shouldn't take long at all. And I said, how, how long have I got? About 10 minutes? And she goes, no, you've got 50 minutes. Oh, can I go to the toilet again? <laughs> so I went to the toilet, dragging my little trolley with me. And that's my little prayer closet. Not a nice prayer closet, but I was just, Lord, I need your help. And it was just total peace. It was just the sense, you know, God was with me, but the prayer. It's like being on a said the same, it's like being on a magic carpet, you're just floating. And I walked into the MRI and I looked at it and I said to the nurse, is that it? And she goes, yeah. Is that what I've been afraid of? And she goes, yeah, that's not scary at all. And it sort of reminds you of that verse about the devil, you know, and they, uh, in Revelation when they're talking about, and is, is this the one that's caused me all this trouble over the years? You know, and it's, it was just deflated all my fears. And it was just, it was a, it was a good experience to the point Towards the end of it, I almost fell asleep. She had to wake me up because I was so relaxed, just laying in there, enjoying God. And had Hillsong on in my head, so I just had the, the pray songs. It was just... Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because there have been a parts of this journey which you have said that ha had the potential to really overtake you when it comes to the fear of certain aspects of this. And yet, what, what is fear? Fear is something that uh, it, it's determined by whose voice we're listening to in this. Exactly right. What are we going to choose to allow to come into a mind? And you spoke about um, the worship playlist. Yes. Yeah, um, part of God's provision again, because I didn't know what was coming up, he did. Um, I spoke to the Steph about a, a playlist because she did one during COVID. So you got another one. She gave me this pre, uh, playlist, uh, playlist, sorry, not playlist, playlist. And the, the first song on the, the one was, was all about Jesus or... I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, it's written down here somewhere. And I kept playing that before I went to hospital. It's just getting your focus on, on Jesus. 
every night before I went to bed, that would be the song on that playlist I'd play. Nothing else, that's it, nothing else. It was just all about Jesus. And uh, when I was in hospital, I just kept playing, I just kept playing that song. I put on my headphones, I'd lay on bed, and I'd have tears running down my face. And the nurses would come in, what's wrong? And I said, I'll just spend your time with Jesus. Or well, spend time with God. Then, okay, give you that blank look and walk out again. Um, <laughs> but um, that was the whole thing. Every time something went wrong, I just go, I've got to go back to Jesus. I've got to just spend time in his presence because he's the only one who can help. And like I said, fear, it's just listening to another voice. You get a lot of things speaking to us throughout life. And uh, we can, it's easy to listen to them. And it's great. If you li- it's great to listen to them. But you can either, as I say to you know, even now, a cad's kid, you know, when bad things happen or scary things happen, it can either drive us away from God or drive us to God. And praise God. It just kept driving me to go oh, because it's great with the MRI. You've got to go through it. And I have to go through this. And a lot of things we have to go through. Models will go through it with God. So I would just yeah, put on the praise songs and just lay there. Praise songs and then the reminders of all of the memory verses, all of the scripture, all of the stories that you have taught our kids for so many years. And now the application for those is, is right there in your own life. And you yep. spoke about, obviously, David yeah. and his attitude towards Goliath. We've got a, um, a, a thing, a couple of boards. Terry Holland did them for me years ago. And I got David and I got Goliath. And they're two things we refer to a lot because I always ask the kids, what's God been doing in your life? Because David, when he came up to his big challenge, which was Goliath at that stage, um, had that testimony of the lion and the bear. And I'd co- often, dis- you know, to me, that heart attack was like a Goliath. They could have taken me out. And I would just think back of the testimony of what God has done. The testimony, you know, the recent one, you know, of being in here in the office and uh, just God's provision in that. And God's provision in everything he's done. So whatever came up, I go, okay, God... Here's something else. I look at your provision. Look at the scriptures that you've given me and just prepare myself. Yep. So. Praise God. Praise God. So coming back to the story. So there's been a few weeks that you've had to recover and strengthen slowly in, in hospital, both from a mental point of view and a physical point of view. And then they release you out to come home. But I'm sure in that period of time, there would have been a dawning on you that um, life's changed. Obviously, you're experiencing the presence of God, and that, that is wonderful. But then when you think about the reality of what has happened and the impact of that on your life moving forward, how did you, how did you think that through and have a hope for the future in that? Probably several stages along the, on the, along the line where I'd start to wake up to the reality. Um, I remember the first time in, in hospital, the first night in hospital, once I'd come conscious and knew what was going on, um, and this might sound strange, but I didn't get to go to heaven and God would send me back home. You know, I was thinking, well, I died. I should have gone to heaven, spent some time with Jesus and come back home. And, um, but I just sort of woke up in hospital. And it's funny how the enemy will, enemy will use anything to play on you. And I had a couple of days that were probably a bit scary at the start where he said, well, you didn't die. You didn't go to heaven. There's no heaven. I'm gonna, you're going to die tonight. And I'd be trying to go to sleep and I'd have to, and it had to keep me awake. And um, so I had a choice, believe on that or believe. I said, God, I know you're true. I know you've done everything through it. I didn't get to heaven and play games with you and then you sent me back. I just died and woke up. But I know you're true. It was a weird thing to be going through your head, but the enemy will use anything uh, to get your focus off Jesus. And so work through that one and then the reality that things have, have changed. I'm going to get a, a, I've had a heart attack or cardiac arrest. Uh, I've got a defib now and uh, I can't do things like I, I used to do. You know, my energy level is way down. The way. It should come good, but then again, I'm told it may not come good. You know, it's just part of life. And um, the dizziness that I, I get, I can do like yesterday, five hours painting, not a problem. I can get up in the morning and walk to the door and almost fall over. It just happens some days. It's just weird. Uh, and as a guy, I like to get, get a handle on it and know what's going on because that's what guys do. And then we fix it. We put silicon on it and it works. Um, <laughs> but uh, the whole fact is I don't know what's going to happen. And, but one thing I do know, that Jesus, well, God was in charge before all this happened. He was in charge while it happened. 
and he's in charge still while it's going on. And it's just a different way of looking at things. And when I say a different way of looking at things, the thing is that God's still in control. And every time I get a, every time I get a, a problem or it gets difficult, I just got to go back to God and say, okay, God, you're in charge. What do you want to do? Where are we going to go through this? How are you going to lead me through it? Because we're called to, to follow him. And um, that's part of and this is still following him. I've just got to continue to walk with him and see where he leads me. I, think, I hope you're hearing what Peter's saying here right throughout this process. He has been tethered to God, to God's truth, to his relationship with God uh, through this whole period of time. And I know that for you, the, the fact that you weren't going to be able to drive for uh, a long period of time afterwards and yep. the realisation of that and the impact of, okay, well, how is this health issue that I'm facing going to impact the kids' ministry here at LMC? And there's these big things that you're considering, and yet that tethering was so important right throughout that process. And still is. Like you said, I can't drive. I couldn't drive for six months. I've got three months left and three days, but I'm not counting. Don't worry about that. <laughs> um, but, and that, that's a big thing for me because my time with God, if I'm, I'm having stress time or I just want to spend time, driving's a, a great thing. I'll go for a drive and just spend time talking to God or I'll go for a walk in the morning uh, and I go for a walk every morning, do my prayer walk. And sometimes we haven't finished what we're talking about, so I'll just keep walking until it's, okay, I'm over now, and then I'll turn around and come back. I'll never turn around halfway through. I'll wait until I finish talking to God. Then we've got some other type of thing, thing to talk through. But that really, that really shook me because what am I going to do now? And the challenge, well, the challenge and the, the joys for me is God's going to show me a new way of doing things with him. I can't sit down and just read and spend time like people do in a chair because I fall asleep. Um, but, yeah, it's just interesting. No matter what you're going through, it might change, every, you know, whatever that might change, but God's still God. And, okay, okay, God, you're going to show me a new and exciting way of experiencing you because everything we go through is another opportunity to experience God in a new way. doesn't matter if it's a, if it's a good thing or a bad thing. You'll never get that opportunity again. I'll never, I don't want this opportunity again either. But I'll, I'm going through something that I didn't think I'd go through. I um, never even thought about it because I had a heart check six years ago and the guy said, your heart's better than it was. Uh, I had a heart check two years ago and he said, your heart's better than it was six years ago and we checked it. It's getting really good. All the things that were sort of climbing up all hit down. The cholesterol was down, sugar level was down, everything was down. So I was thinking, great. I've got no health issues. This is going to be good. And all of a sudden this hit me. But it's an opportunity of going through something different with God. And sure, I don't like what I'm going through, but I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm enjoying what God's doing and I'm enjoying discovering God in a new way. And that's fun. It's fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, what a great perspective that God was able to give you, bless you with throughout this time. Something that you shared with me that I thought was such a key to this was when you were considering what it looked like moving forward, what it's, my involvement in kids' ministry is going to be, how am I going to do this? You said um, one of your acknowledgements to God was, God, I don't care what I do. Yeah. I just want to be with you. Yes. And that's one thing in hospital when I was just laying there, just spending time with God. Um, I got to, got to the point where I don't care what happens, God. It's just me and you. You just lay in there. It's like that song. You know. I forgot the name of the song already, Steph. What is it? Nothing, Nothing else. Okay, nothing else but to, and that's what it's, it's all about. And I just lay in there one and I go, Lord, I don't care what, I don't care if I don't do kids ministry again. I don't care if I don't do anything again. As long as I can just spend that time with you, it's whatever you want. And praise God, he's got me back doing kids ministry because I really didn't want to do real women. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but it's just like with, it's like with everything along the line, whatever God's got me to do, he's always given me the heart to do it. And one day kids ministry will stop. You know, someone else will take over and they'll run with it. But then, but my experiences with God won't stop, you know. Whatever, what door closes and one opens, you still got God. And your experiences with God on earth don't change. When we go to heaven, we get a totally different experience with God. But while we're doing time on earth, um, when you think it, we won't experience God this way any other way than going through the things we're going through. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, 
Let me ask you, uh, ask you this. Uh, once you've had that realisation and you've had this, even this revelation as well, you start to strengthen in a way that you're like, I can get started now. You know, I, I feel like I'm over this, this hump and I can feel like I can start walking in my purpose again, you know, yeah. with, with what I was able to do. But it, it wasn't exactly that. It wasn't just jumping back into things straight away. There was a process to go through uh, in that as well. And how did you continue to find purpose in God, not enabling you to do everything that you thought you wanted to do, but continuing to do the little that you could or the other things? How did you find God's purpose in that limitation? Um, I think the fact, the realisation that God's still in charge. The kids' ministry is not my, it's not my ministry, it's God's ministry. Yeah. I've been blessed to have a lot of people, a lot of great people around me, a lot of great leaders and uh, I have a, the, the joy of working with them. Um, my tendency is to run ahead, and God's got to catch up. Um, but he doesn't play like that. And the hard bit for me, even going forward now, is still li is listening to God because I like to just run ahead. I get so excited. I just want to keep going. Um, but I've got to listen to God because things have changed. And things will, will look different for me. Um, not going to be worse it's going to be better because whatever god whatever god blesses is going to be better so going through this is better for me even though i don't like it it is it's got to be better for me because i'm walking with god through it and who knows what he's going to do with it who knows where what's going to happen down the track but all i know I just got to keep taking one step at a time with with god to spend the time with him listen to him enjoy what he's doing and stop whinging to him and he told me off for doing that one day. I was whinging about not being able to drive. And he, got, he just said to me, stop. He, he, he learnt from you, Graham. He's straight down the line. Stop whinging. Enjoy what, what I'm doing. Yeah. And I go, okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, I think resting in the sovereignty of God yes. in those seasons is so important. And we've already heard a word and encouragement about that this morning that we so often in life get to a point where we do not have control over the situation that we are facing. And yet God is sovereign above our circumstances. He is sovereign over it all. And you can rest in that knowledge and find peace in that, right? Sure can. It's really strange the way we want to take it back off God, isn't it? Yeah. Once things, yeah. I, I know, I agree. Once things start to get going, I want to take it back off God. I've got it from here now. And he goes, okay. <laughs> and <it> just laughs. Because <laughs> you do silly things. One of, the, um, one of the questions that inevitably we end up asking through seasons like this that we face in our own lives is, God, why? God, why have you allowed this to happen? Yep. Um, why is this happening to me? But as we were speaking about this this week, you said, well, actually, that question wasn't the right question to ask. It was a question that was asked, yeah. but God, there was another better question that I had to ask of God. Yeah, it's... I think it's, you know, when I look back, I think it's a bit self-centered when you start asking, God, what has happened to me? Because I, it's life. Things happen in life. It's not about why this happened to me. It has happened to me, God. What are, what are you going to lead me out into? Or what are, what are you doing with it? And that's the big thing because, you know, Romans 8, 28, yeah? all things work together for good. And that whole thing about trusting God and just saying, okay, God, this did happen to me. It's part of life. Didn't see it coming. Had no idea. But it happened. So now... Where are we going from here? And, yeah, it should be my attitude all the way along, but we tend to, when everything's going good, you tend to just be rushing ahead. And now someone asked me, did you learn anything from this? Yeah, they asked me while I was in hospital. It just felt like God gave me a little, little bit of a whack on the back of the head, not a, bad, a hard whack to rebuke me, but just a look at me. And that's the one thing I've probably got out of it, is just look at me. And... Um, it's very easy to get your eyes off God. My eyes weren't off God, but they were half on God and half on where I'm going. Now they've got to, they've got to be fully on God because he's the one in control. And we've, got, we've got things, you don't know what's coming up ahead. Um, we've got things in the world that is falling apart and everything like that. God wants people who will watch him, people who will listen to him, people who will obey him. And I think that's sort of the big wake up. You know, Yes, there's things happening. I want you to watch me. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Um, so as we sit here today, mate, it's been 12 weeks. Yep. 12 weeks since your cardiac time. arrest. It's not that long. It's not that long. 
but it, feel, it might like feel a like long, a long time. When you're not driving, it's a long time. <laughs> so having heard the story now 12 weeks on, like, tell us, like, obviously they didn't remove your sense of humour. Um, obviously you're able to get up here and speak like this, which is a yeah. wonderful thing. How are you doing? And where are things at right now? Um, I'd like to say everything's going good. I've got my eyes on God 24-7, but that's not true. I go up and down like everyone else goes up and down. Yeah, you sort of... Um, I've got this thing here which I like to play with. It's my little defib, keeps me going. Um, it's because I'm a guy. You like that? Oh, look, it's got a, it's got a little bit here. And I said to Jenny a while ago, I said, "Oh, I think it's got a lid." She said, Don't open it. I go, oh, better, "Better not." It hasn't got a lid. I looked at it, um, but uh, I just got to keep focusing on God every every day. Just when I start thinking down, I go down the negative path. Uh, the enemy gets in my ear. Like last night, he's, you know. He gets in your ear and says, well, you can't do this, you can't do that. God knows all that. Um, so for the, the journey forward is just keep my eyes on him. That's brilliant. I've got to keep my eyes on him. Brilliant. Amen. Amen. Uh, you know, I asked Pete about the limitations that he, he, he faces right now and in, that, in, the, in the gap that is between what my mind wants me to do and what my body can actually do, there's a working out how do I, how do I reconcile yep. that. And speaking about the limitations, he said this to me, and it just stuck with me so well. He said, there might be limitations with regard to that, but there's no limitations when it comes to me spending time with God. And I thought that was just such a, such a statement that underwrote everything else that he has said and every part of this journey and the revelation that you've had through this. There is no limitation when it comes to the time that I get to spend with God. Yeah. And probably when I got to that realisation any other way, so... Um, being forced to spend time with God, being forced to feel totally helpless, depending on everyone else. I've never had to feel totally helpless before. I'm always, I can do that. And feeling totally helpless in the hospital and that, that time when you saw me in the photo and stuff like that, where I can't do anything, I don't know what's going on. I had to you know, just yeah, work out where I am with God and realise that, hey, it's just all you, God. And that's a beautiful spot to be. It's like jumping out of a plane with a parachute. You know, without that parachute, you you're on your own. And this is like my parachute. I'm, I'm relying on the parachute. I'm relying on God. It, it is beautiful and a, a beautiful testimony. You have got a beautiful testimony. We all have a beautiful testimony. Every day we wake up, God's with us. We've got a beautiful testimony. And, um, yeah, in the midst of the frustrations, I do get frustrated, as people know me. Um, I'm just enjoying God and enjoying the new experience I'm have, having, finding God and experiencing God in a new way. Right. Praise God. Praise God. Come on, let's thank this guy. <laughs> praise, praise God. Praise God for not only the fact that this man is sitting here today, physically sitting here, but for the ability to share such a wonderful testimony and encouragement to all of us. And I hope there has been something in that for you when it comes to your own time spent with the Lord because we all, there is no limitation on the time that you can spend with him. Now, I want to ask Pete to pray, and to pray for anybody here, and whether, that's, whether it's that part of your life, and you, and you think, oh, I just need to be spending more time with God, or whether there's been something that you've faced in your life where control has been released, and there's nothing that you can really do about that that you're experiencing, those circumstances, but there is something that you have control over, and that's the perspective of those circumstances that you're going through. And I want to ask Pete to pray for anyone who's in that situation where you might just look at your life and you look at what's coming in front of you and say, I just don't know. I just don't know what to do with this, that, that you would fix your eyes on Jesus. And so if we can all stand while Pete prays for us, and I'm not going to ra ask for a raising of hands or anything, but just an acknowledgement um, between you and God today as Pete prays that God will give you uh, his perspective over the situation you find yourself in. Thanks, Pete. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, just stand here in joy, dear God, and thank you, dear God, because, Lord, we are all on a journey. We are all on a journey, and on that journey, Lord, there are good times, there are bad times, there are scary times, dear God, and, but you are still God. You are still in control. You are still Lord of all. So I just pray for all of us here, dear God, that as we go through, and if we are even now going through scary times, that we remember that we can turn to you, that we should 
turn to you, that you should be the first one we turn to, dear God. Whether it's fear of sickness um, or whatever, our circumstances, Lord, or even uh, I talked a little bit about it before, having the fear of death, dear God, because that the enemy can hang that over us, Lord. We know, Lord, that you have taken away all our fears, Lord. You have dealt with fear. You have dealt with sin. You've dealt with death, dear God. And I just thank you, Lord, as we stand here today, Lord, that we can praise you, that we can bless you, dear God, and say thank you, Lord, because we have the victory through you, dear God. And, Lord, I just pray as, as a finish up, dear God, that we would never forget to turn to you in times of trouble to turn to you and say, Lord, thank you because I don't like what I'm going through. But Lord, I love going through it with you. Lord, it's just beautiful. Amen. 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 Father, I, I just thank you so much for this man. I thank you for the testimony, not only of the last uh, few weeks and few months, Lord God, but I thank you for the testimony of his life. I thank you for the many lives that have been touched by the authentic love he has for you, Lord Jesus. And Father, we pray for your blessing to be upon him, Lord God, as he continues not only to recover, Lord God, but to think forward to the future that you have, not just for his life, but for the kids in this church and in this community. Father, I pray that you would continue to release fresh vision to Pete right now. Father, that he would begin to see the future. And whether it is him at full capacity, just running with this, or it's the leading of the other leaders who are going to lead us into that space, Lord God, I pray that you would release that vision to him right now in Jesus' wonderful name. Father, we thank you for the closeness of relationship we have with you. We thank you that you are a God that is not far off, but that you are close to us and that you are here in every situation we find ourselves in. So, Father, have your way this day. Have your way in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' wonderful name. And we all said, Amen. Okay, let me thank Pete again. I'd just like us to pray for uh, Jenny and for Rachel and for Laura because, and Matt, of course, because they've carried a load as well. Father, we just thank you for family. And Father, Pete has uh, shared so much about his trust and confidence in you, but I just thank you for those that you gathered around him, particularly Jenny. And uh, Laura and Rachel, Lord God, and uh, Matt over in China. Father, I just pray that you would continue to strengthen them as a family. And then, Father, that the test people would not just be Pete's, but it would be the family's test. Father, again, we just give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, before we go, we're going to just close and we're just going to sing that song that Pete talked about, Nothing Else. I just want you and nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you. And let this be. Confession of your heart to him today. Come on, thanks, guys. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else. Thank you, Jesus. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, my oh Lord. Nothing else. Search our hearts, oh God. Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else.
caught up in your presence. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord, for the freedom that we have to enter into your presence boldly and with confidence because of what your son Jesus has done. And so, Jesus, as we come and as we think on what we have just heard today and as we think on what we have just sung, the confession of our hearts, that we just want you, Jesus, we glorify you for all that you have done to enable this to be possible. So, Lord, have your way. Have your way in our hearts that you might be glorified to the greatest extent. We just want you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Church, thank you so much for coming along today. Uh, Don't forget we've got 6 p.m. service tonight. Grab a cup of tea, a cup of coffee after the service. We hope to see you back tonight. God bless.